Thanks for joining me for a new class, Fortifying Your Faith in an Age of Deconstruction. Now, earlier this year, our friend Mike Lewis, you know, Big Mike over there at Southwest, posted something on his Facebook about a time in his life about 20 years ago when he started experiencing some doubt in his life. And there were plenty of books that he was able to read and look at that would help along this deconstruction. And he said as he went through this, there began a point to where he began to even doubt his own baptism. Uh, he felt like the church was out of date and, and, uh, and irrelevant. And he wanted to leave ministry because everybody was not doing it right and the church was all messed up. And uh, he went in this downward spiral to the point where he finally left the church and he said he felt suicidal. And then he met a Christian man that helped him back and he started reading the Word of God once again and he reestablished his faith. Mm. But mm -hmm. uh, there's this point of deconstruction that I wanted to talk about during this study. Deconstruction of faith. It's something that we hear spoken about quite a bit. You know, really falling away from God, falling away from the church is nothing new. It, it happened during Jesus' ministry. In John, the sixth chapter, for instance, in John 6, verse 66 and following, it says, As a result of this, there were some statements Jesus had made, As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You know, where are we going to go when we leave you? That's what they said. But there were a lot that did fall away for many reasons. Deconstruction stories are real popular right now. We, we read of people who have left the faith, and there's so many that are are evangelistic in their deconstruction on the internet that it seems to be a popular thing amongst uh, celebrities and those in younger generations. And in fact, in, even in my own family, I've seen those who have deconstructed their faith. And so it's something that's very much a concern for me, and it should be a concern for all of us, because we don't want anyone to fall away from God. You know, what it seems to happen in these cases is they come to a conclusion that they want to have, and then they try to justify that conclusion. In other words, they want to leave. For whatever reason, they want to leave. Uh, doubts may have come up in their life. There's doubts. Doubts come in many shapes and many forms, and you probably had some doubts. We've all experienced doubts from time to time, and we've gone through some points in our life where there's a bit of struggle in our faith. And sometimes there's just disappointment with the church. Uh, Maybe you were mistreated at church. You know, people are hard to live with. And people at church are just people. And they can be hard to live with. And maybe they've disappointed you. Or, or maybe you looked at the church and you've come to a conclusion like Tim did. It's just irrelevant and it's not making any point And it, they're not doing church the way I think they should be doing it. And uh, you become disillusioned. Or, or, or maybe there's a lifestyle contradiction. And I think this is the most a uh, popular way of leaving. The biggest, perhaps the biggest reason people leave the faith is because of lifestyle contradictions. Maybe you've met somebody who's not a Christian and you want to hang out with that person now and, and, and they don't like that Christian lifestyle. Uh, or maybe you want yourself some more, more unrestrained sex or more unrestrained partying or drugs or whatever it might be. Uh, a lifestyle without wisdom, a lifestyle without discernment. It seems like there's so much freedom there. I can just do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. Frank Turret, who uh, goes to different colleges and talks to them about faith in Christ, and he's what we call an apologetic. Uh, he gives reasons for believing in God and believing in Christianity. And he says at the end of his his talk, uh, uh, there's always a time for question and answers, and there's always a group of atheists there. And he says that they'll come and begin to ask their questions. And in a way, it's sort of a pushback to these folks. But also to put things in perspective, he asked these atheists if you could prove 
that Christianity was true, would you become a Christian? And you might be surprised at how many people say no. <laughs> it would mess up their, their lifestyle. It would mess up the, what they want. And so if you want to have that kind of lifestyle, but you've grown up in Christianity, you need to deconstruct that faith. You need to have a reason why Christianity is not what you thought it was all these years. And so deconstruction is just looking for ways to walk away. And with the internet, there are no shortage of deconstruction evangelists, <laughs> those that will help you in your journey to walk away from God. And as a society, we've become more progressive, and people want a Christianity that's more progressive, more politically correct, uh, maybe a, a little less Jesus and a little more Oprah, uh, a postmodern liberalism. And we refer to that as progressive Christianity. And that's what we're going to be talking about, progressive Christianity. And if you want to have some resources about this topic, there are many places you can go. I could suggest a couple. I would suggest maybe going to uh, lisachilders.com. Uh, she does a great job in her podcast explaining this deconstruction process because she went through that process at one time and now she's come back and rebuilt her faith. You'd go to Frank Turek, mentioned him a moment ago. He has a program called Cross Examined. Uh, both of these you can find online, either on uh, YouTube or on their own, on their own uh, page. There's uh, other resources. One of our uh, brothers in Christ, David Young, a uh, preacher in the Church of Christ, wrote a book not long ago called A Grand Illusion. And he has sermons and he has material about this as well. And uh, there, there's so much to cover in this class. I'm thinking, well, no, where do I start and what do I talk about? Because I want to talk about so many different things. And so I, I've, I thought I would use an outline that was in a book that I have by Michael Kruger. It was called The Ten Commandments for Progressive Christianity. And I would just use that as a beginning, as a starting place, as a jumping off place to give me some kind of of outline I could follow as I go along this class. And one of the first things that people do when they want to deconstruct their faith is redefine Jesus. They have to look at Jesus differently than they have in the past. And what they will begin to say is this, Jesus is a model for living more than an object for worship. Uh, a corollary to this is Jesus came to be a good person to help and heal people. Or another correlator would be that Jesus is just was just a social uh, activist. And uh, sorry, I have a buzzer going off here. And, and, and so I, I want to address this idea of redefining Jesus. Uh, I, what I don't want to do in this study is build up a straw man and then attack him somehow. I don't want to beat him down because I want this to be a positive message. I want this to be a, a positive class. I don't want to look so much at, at these negatives, but I want to recognize that there is a deconstruction going on in many people's lives that's very popular. And one of the reasons that is happening is because folks like me have not given them reasons why that is not a good idea. So let's talk about who Jesus is for a moment. Is he just a social activist? Is he just a good role model? And this is a problem because we have to step out with a little bit of caution. For anything to be believed, there has to be enough truth in it to be believable. And there is an aspect where Jesus is to be an example. He did come to be an example. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, and we've been looking that, at that in our Sunday morning uh, uh, sermons, is 1 Peter. In 1 Peter 2, Peter says that Jesus was an example for us that we should follow in his steps. Paul often said to, uh, to follow him, to emulate him as he emulated Christ. As he looked at Christ as an example, and was then he became an example. And so look at him as he emulates Christ. 
And you say, well, well, why? Why would we look at Jesus as an example? Because he's deity. He is God. In fact, if Jesus was not God, and if he just came to set up a, a moral system of some sort, well, who cares? Why would his moral system be any better than anybody else's moral system? And that's the conclusion they want us to get to. But if he is deity, if he is God, if he is somebody to be worshipped, then he is someone that needs to be listened to as a legitimate example. And Jesus is God. Every time you read those words, Son of God, how many times you read the word Son of God in Scripture? That is a divine claim. Back in the Old Testament, when the prophecies of Jesus coming were made, in Isaiah, the ninth chapter, for instance, in verse 6, and we're familiar with these words, but let's stop and take a look at them for just a moment. He says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. He will be known as the Mighty God. He will be known as the Eternal Father. In fact, we have the name Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus dwelling with us. When you walk through the Gospel of John, that is the emphasis that John places on Jesus, that he is God who has come to dwell amongst us. For instance, just to take a little bit of a walk through the Gospel of John, beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus is God. He is the Creator God. Nothing has come except for by Him. He was in the beginning with God, and He was God, it says. Verse 14, it tells us that that word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Move over to chapter 5 of John for a moment. Verse 18. It says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. That's why they were upset with him. He was making himself equal with God by calling himself the Son of God. You see the that, that phrase, Son of God, it is given as the equivalent of, of God. He is saying that He is God. In chapter 8, in John, to move along through chapter, through John, chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, he was there before Abraham. He was there with God. He was God. Let's go to chapter 10, verse 33. Uh, the Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus claimed to be God. In the rest of the New Testament, we have many claims of Jesus' deity. Uh, for an example, let's go to Hebrews, the first chapter, for a moment. Hebrews chapter 1. And here's how the book of Hebrews begins. God, after he spoke, long ago to the fathers of the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, 
whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son? Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he begins bringing, again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire? But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Jesus is the Creator God. He is God Himself. And we can get back into this concept of the Trinity later on, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But we have one God, and three characteristics of that God, and Jesus is that God. In Titus chapter 2, another place we can go. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. He called Jesus our great God. Of course, you have all the doxologies in the New Testament. The praises of God addressed to Jesus. You have the entire book of Revelation that shows Jesus is God. Jesus was worshipped as God and will be worshipped as God. We just read in Hebrews, the angels worship God. In the book of Matthew, and Matthew being the most Jewish book, Jewish people will not bow down to anyone but God. In chapter 14, after Jesus calmed the storm, it says in verse 33, And those who were with him in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's Son. And go to chapter 28 of Matthew. After the, the resurrection of Jesus, and Jesus appeared to his disciples, and in chapter 28 verse 9, And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. They worshipped him as God, and they will continue to worship him as God. Uh, Philippians, the second chapter, has one of the great texts on this. Verse 8, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow to Jesus. Every tongue will confess who he is. They'll either do it now, or they'll do it in eternity after the judgment, but they will find out who he is. Now, one of the great points that C.S. Lewis brought out in his book, Mere Christianity, when he was making this point, he brought a, a trilemma. It's like a dilemma, but it's a trilemma. There's three aspects of it. You have Jesus claiming to be God. And if you say, well, He's just a, a good man and not God. Well, wait a minute. Did he know that he wasn't God? If he knew that he wasn't God, but claimed to be God, then he wasn't a good man. In fact, he was a liar. Jesus would have been a liar to claim that he was God if he knew he wasn't. And let's say that because he did claim to be God, let's say he claimed to be God, but didn't know it. 
He didn't know that he wasn't God. And then you'd have to say that he was a lunatic. He was crazy. And so you can't say that he's just a good role model because either he was a liar or he was a lunatic. Or the third option is that what he said was true. He knew it was true. He accepted it as true. He is God. And therefore, we have to come to the conclusion that he is Lord. Maybe you've heard this, that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. And that's what he's trying to, to tell us. He's trying to prevent us from saying that Jesus was just a good role model or a good teacher. Uh, he's anything but that. He is God. You know, one of the odd things about the deconstructionists, by the way, is if Jesus is a good example, as they claim he is, a good role model, as they claim he is, then why don't they follow him? They don't want to follow him. They just want to redefine him. I mean, they don't want to follow Matthew 19th chapter, that marriage is between one man and one woman, uh, that it's uh, one man and one woman for life. They don't want to follow uh, John the 14th chapter or 6, salvation is only found in Christ. They want a pluralism of, of ways that we can come to God. And, and so, you know, if he is just a moral example, why don't they follow him? Well, it's just a smokescreen. Uh, in fact, Christianity is not a religion of morality. And that's where it comes down to. Christianity is not a religion of morality. In fact, historic Christianity is a religion of grace. Uh, they'll have these phrases, catchphrases that sound cool. Deeds, not creeds. Uh, creeds divide, but love unites. What they're saying is, it's our behavior that's important. Not what we believe, but the way we behave. And what they've done is reduce Christianity to a religion of works, of merit. And that's so easy to do, to become legalistic in their claims about Christianity. Christianity is about grace. It's not about what we do. It's about what he has done. It's about his death burial and resurrection. It's about his love for us that came in the form of, of Jesus to die on the cross for us. What we see in some of these folks when they want to deconstruct Christianity is this fear-based Christianity. They're, they're afraid they're going to go to hell. They, they have no surety in their life and they want to deconstruct Christianity to try to get away from that. But what's happened is they have just misunderstood what Christianity was all about to start with. It's about grace. It's about what God has done. And I'm embarrassed to see some people walk away from Christianity who should know better, who should know about this doctrine of grace, and yet they emphasize the works. They emphasize this uh, commandments and morality instead of what God has done. Christianity should always begin with what God has done. One last point just before I close it. Just to say this, if you want to walk away from Christianity, you don't need a reason. You just need an excuse, and any will do. I hope you have a, a great week.